All right, well, welcome back to Noob School. As you can tell, we have a little different setup today. We've got a new show called Sales Talk, and me and my trusty sidekick, Marty Osborne. <laughs> hey, John. Hell. Hey, Hell, Marty. Marty's here to help me do some sales talking. And so we're going to pick a subject every week. This week is attitude, and we'll have a guest out here a little bit later. So we'll have some fun today. So we're really going to try to give you a little deeper dive into one subject. So we'll start with attitude. Now, probably like all of you, I've always heard attitude is very important. Like you got to have a good attitude. You got to have a great attitude if you want to be successful. And I think I believed that as a youngster, but I didn't really uh, understand how to have a great attitude, right? Some things I had a good attitude about, some things I didn't. For example, Sports, I got a lot of positive uh, reinforcement uh, on sports. I really had a great attitude about sports, but not so much on school because I would hear things like, um, school's boring, school's dumb, I can't wait for school to be out, I can't wait to burn my books, can't wait for summer. Kind of the common refrains I heard as a kid about school. You know, that's all you hear, that's what you believe. So, you know, only really when I turned about 25, 26 years old, someone gave me a cassette tape of Zig Ziglar, who, if, if you don't listen to Zig already, is kind of the grandfather of all the, the great uh, sales motivational speakers. And he convinced me, um, just by listening to him, that we need to have a positive attitude about everything we do. Now, the next question is, how do you do that? And that's what uh, Marty and I are going to talk about today. There's a book out there called Reframe Your Brain by Scott Adams. Uh, and Scott has, has, has really given us the, the playbook for how to reframe things in your mind where you can have a positive attitude about everything, you know, not just your sports, but your, your schoolwork, too. So, Marty, I know you have read the book. Um, give me your thoughts on it so far. Oh, wow. Um, actually, really, I told John, I said, uh, <laughs> when we were just chatting about it, it could be another one of my top five books. Wow. Like, you know, um, what, what I think the book does is it takes a very sort of simple concept of refraining or taking a thought and then how to reframe it to think a little bit differently, yeah. how to change your attitude. Yeah. And, and it's funny because the brain works that way. Right. And, um, you know, there used to be the five second rule. I don't know if you've ever seen that, that uh, where it says when you're trying to get up in the morning and you can't get up, just count down five, mm. four, three to what and it's amazing like you just get up like yeah. you reset your brain and so um the concepts in there i think were just really amazing and got me you know thinking about all kinds of new things around attitude yeah well <clears throat> when uh, we, we both have read the read the book and talked about it a little bit when marty and i were talking uh this past weekend marty's a big clemson fan and i remember i'm not i'm not i pulled for south carolina i'll admit it um but Clemson has kind of been the hunt for the national championship every year, at least of late. And a couple of years ago, they lost a the game early in the season to Syr Syracuse? No, it was actually Pittsburgh. 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 Yeah. Pittsburgh. And you would think, you know, that that's it. Like, you know, here's my, my wrong thinking would be like, this season's over. You know, we're not good enough. We lost our quarterback. You know, whatever it is that happened, happened. And you kind of shrug your shoulders like, well, it's over. And my Clemson friends, Marty included, they, they said things like, you know what, it's early in the season. You know, we can lose one game and still get to the, the playoffs. We could win, win the national championship. We have time to solve the problems we have on defense or whatever it was. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. But isn't that a good example of reframing? I think, well, it's a great example because I think one of the things – that we kind of learned, I think, early on with the, with Dabo is he loves the word believe, mm. right? Believe. Yeah. And, you know, they talk about every meeting when he took over as a coach, he would have a sign at every meeting that said believe. Mm -hmm. And one time he was late to a meeting, he was like meeting the administrator and he came running in and he didn't have a sign with him. And the players made him go back to his office, get his sign, and bring it in. Wow. Because it was all about believing. And yeah. so not only did he have the team believing, but he had us fans believing. And, yeah. I mean, we never forget the game against Pittsburgh. We lost. We could have won it last second. Deshaun throws an interception, and we're all like, oh, 
But we're like, that's okay. Yeah. It's okay. We still believe. We still believe, yeah. right? You yeah. got to believe. And yeah. I think that's really what attitude separates winners from losers. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Let's talk about some other reframes in the book. I know you have a whole, a whole long list of them. Um, one of them, which, which I love, is the, the original framing that a lot of people believe is like life is not fair, right? <laughs> life is not fair. And, and, um, and then the reframing is where can I find where it's not fair in my favor, mm-hmm. right? Because it is, it is not fair, right? Yep. It's not, it's not all, we're not all equal. Um, you know, people might say, gosh, John, you're too tall or you're, you're too, you're too, you're too heavy or too, too old or your hair's too long. You know, well, they can, they can find something. Yep. Um, or maybe you're not technical enough. They could certainly say that about me. Yeah. You know, but you know, I found, you know, sales and sales training, you know, works real well for me. I wouldn't do very well in an engineering field. Right. Um, so I think that's the key is to find out where your spot is. And also understand some will have more than others, mm-hmm. right? So let's let's hear your your thought on that. Yeah, your I, I, well, we, it's kind of funny because that word fairness. We kind of live in this world today where everything's about what's fair. Yeah. You know, are you paying your fair share or whatever? And what we find is that I think <laughs> we probably laugh when you know something happens as a kid and somebody gets two pieces of candy and we go, "That's not fair." Yeah. And what does our mom say, son? Life isn't fair, <laughs> right? And so, you so the, believe it. You believe it. So, I think the refrain is life isn't fair, right? But the key to success is it's not going to be fair. And I think we have to look at in sales is we have to find what it is that makes us give us an unfair advantage. Right. And right. I think that's the key, right? Is there's something in what we do is going to be different than our competitors that's yeah. not fair? And yeah. Um, I think one of the great stories is when I worked with you at DataStream and then we worked for Infor and I went to start my company at Voco. Yeah. One of the reasons I started it is because I knew all the salespeople, I knew the customers, I knew the developers. And guess what? I had an unfair advantage. Sure. It was like counting cards at the casino. Right. And that's how we built it. And people, some people even said, well, that's not fair. And I'm like, well, that's sort of life. <laughs> yeah, but they could they could go back and work a data stream twenty years ago. I mean, they could. I agree. I totally agree. Um, you know the um, what, what's another example? Of- well, I, it was funny this weekend. I had another really good example of refraining, and uh, I was talking to my um, to my niece, and she just had a new baby, and kept dropping the pacifier, and she said, "Yeah, we used to worry about it, but." you know, germs kind of build, you know, immunity, <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, I think about that sometimes like germs, like, you know, our frame is germs are bad and we've seen that, but really reframing is germs ha- actually help us build immunities. Right. And yeah. so there's just some simple things like that, that in our brain, we want to try to construct a narrative when in actuality, if we just reframe it, yeah. It opens up the doors to whatever. Yeah, and you can practice on anything. Like, like, like this weekend or yesterday. I think it was yesterday. Marty texted me. We had this whole got the studio lined up, you know, for weeks. And he says, "Hey, oh, by the way, I I can't make it at the right time. You know, I forgot <laughs> something. You know." And so uh, immediately, because I was reading the book, I was like, "That's not going to be a problem. Mm-mm. You know, we're going to figure it out. You know, and in one way or another." And sure enough, the studio was able to switch it. My other guest was able to switch it, and. Worked out fine, but even if that wouldn't have worked out, we'd have we'd have figured something out. Yeah, I I I believe that. And what what an example he does in the book, and this is one of my favorite yeah. it's called talent stacking. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you know we're told like just be really good at something with passion, right? right? Is sort right. of the the frame. But the reframe frame is why can't you be at multiple things that when put together makes you even more indispensable. And I think about sales, right? I think sometimes we kind of box ourselves in and we look at handling objections or, you know, cold calling or whatever, like we're looking at when we should sort of talent stack, like why aren't we learning about negotiation training? Why are we not learning about how to write a better proposal or read a marketing book, right? Right. Because marketing books, like one of my favorites, um, Story Brand, helps teach you to think simply. And I mean, you were great at data stream. 
you know, we brought Bill Garcia in and we taught everybody sales negotiations, mm-hmm. but people think, oh, negotiations is at the end. I've got to get there. But I think it's so it's important everything. to talent stack yeah. and that refrain is don't just be good at one thing, but what multiple things can right. we do? Right. Absolutely. So you think about in a typical company, let's say Marty's the boss and he's got these two people and they're both good salespeople. They're both making their number and they're both good people. But one of them also has gotten very good at public speaking. One of them also, you know, dresses a little nicer, kind of wears the blazer. Um, and also is a, is a, let's just say, uh, plays the piano, you know. And so it comes time for promotion. And there's really no, there's just no doubt which one's going to get the promotion. It's the one with the, with the talent stack, yeah. right? You, you see that person kind of moving up and doing more things. They're kind of proving they can handle more than just selling. So I'm a big believer now. My talent stack is so diverse. I, I convinced <laughs> myself it's all going to come together one day, yep. but but you know we'll see we'll see about that. Well, I think just your I think playing the saxophone and doing the Basker stuff. I mm-hmm. mean, I think that sort of proves you can kind of do something different and learn, but it makes you a lot more interesting. Yeah. And think about it in the sales world, it's not just about selling and focused, right? We buy from people we like. We buy from people that are interesting. Yeah. And when you start to add interesting things to your repertoire, yeah. I think it makes you really separate to yeah. an unfair advantage. I agree. That's the idea. That's too. it. That's the idea. But it is true. You know, I, I do play the saxophone on the street, and uh, and I'll do it any in any city, you know, any country. And it, you know, when you do that, you get comfortable doing it. It makes speaking in public and meeting new people, all that stuff becomes quite easy. Yeah. So the one other concept in the book that I also liked was, you know, just sort of, you know, be yourself, right? Be yourself. You know, you just have to be yeah. authentic, be yourself. But the refrain is, don't necessarily be yourself. Do something awkward. Do something embarrassing. Mm-hmm. Because the only way we're ever going to grow, right? And and I love the concept of, you know, how, why do we just want to be good when we can be better each right. and every day? Right. And so to me, challenging ourselves to do awkward things, to do a speaking, to do a podcast. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure when you first started playing under the bridge, yeah. right? It, yeah. Like it's, you probably like, oh, God, people are going to see me. And you're yeah. like, yeah, great, whatever. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's the way most things are. It's like approaching a stranger or making a cold call or whatever. You you fear this thing and it's not there, Yeah. right? Uh, a couple more I want to talk about. Um, one is is the word hate. You know, when someone says, I hate this person, it's a wonderful reframe to say, hate, when I hate someone, it's me punishing myself for the misdeeds of others. Mm-hmm. So somebody's being a jerk, and I punish myself for it. It's so it's so silly. Yeah, I, yeah I, you know, it's funny, that one... Um, I remember now reading that because it does jump out at you that why am I now being consumed <laughs> with somebody else's attitude yeah. or actions when, quite frankly, they have nothing to do with me. And right. I think one of the things that I know I'm guilty of this, and I think we all are, is in that scenario, too, is we want to talk bad about that person or, you know, can you believe this person or so forth? But again, it's taking up all of our energy yeah. about us not about them so yeah yeah, it's a great one well okay um one more which i loved which was my past trauma has just crippled me (laughs) right and people can believe that their whole life it's just it ruined me you know the reframe is my past trauma is why i can kick ass yeah all right It, it gave me that spark i needed and I've seen that with people before. They yeah. really you know, they had that thing in them that came from some trauma. Yeah. And they didn't, like Michael Jordan didn't make his uh, 10th grade team. Yeah. You know, and he, he became kind of good, kind of a beast. You yeah. Know? So anyway, I think those are some good ones. We could talk more with, uh, with Mike when he comes out. But yeah. I highly recommend everyone uh, get this book or listen to it. Uh, Reframe Your Brain uh, by Scott Adams. I'll see if I can grab a copy here in a minute so I'll have it up where you can see it. Uh, so after you read this book, Sales for Noobs. Or reread it. Or reread it. You can't get enough. We just republished it. You can see we have a new cover. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So we're going to take a, a quick break. When we come back, we're going to have Mike Thacker here. Uh, and we're talking about his new business and also get his take on, on the book too. So we'll be right back. 
Don't forget to pick up your copy of Sales for Noobs. This book will help any young person that wants to go into sales. Hey, you can pick up my CD, Jazz at the Falls, on Spotify or Amazon. Your choice. Hope you enjoy it. All right. Hey, welcome back. Welcome back. That was uh, that was some darn good break music. Thank you, Chris. Um, well, Marty, now we've got one of our old friends, Mike Thacker, coming out. I think this is going to be exciting because we go back a long way. We do go back a long way. He yeah. was one of those... Uh, I think he was in the gifted program in sales because he uh, he didn't have to follow all the rules, yeah. <laughs> like getting to work at a certain time or making a certain number of calls. He would just yeah. he would just achieve his quota every every day. Right, yeah. but see, you reframed it. You said, you know, you have to be here from eight to five. But the refrain is, why does it matter if somebody's meeting their numbers? It does not. It does not matter. <laughs> so, Mike, come on, come on and join us, Mike. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good job. Welcome Thank aboard. You. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Appreciate it, yes, sir. <clears throat> All right, Mike. You've been on the uh, podcast once before. Yes, one of the original old studio podcasts. It was like first ten people, I think. Yeah, it was. I think I was one of the first three. All right. So how long do we go back, Mike? We go back to 1998. 1998. Yes, sir. So 98 plus the 20, 22 plus two. Yeah. What's that? 24. 23, 25. 24 years. Never had a fight. So, almost. We almost had an incident. Yeah, we did. We did. <laughs> you were out of town. There was a... Uh, so, John, potential. it's uh, 23, so it's 25. 23? Yeah. 25? Can we roll that back? Yeah. No. Roll that back one 25, 23, I don't know yeah, what it 25. was. 25. <laughs> All right. It's well, 23. Well, you started as a sales guy working with me, mm-hmm. and like I was, we were, we were riffing with Barty, you uh, you had, we call them Thacker rules. Yes. And they were stuff we agreed to. Yeah. I said, as long as you... Unspoken. If you make your number, I'm a hands-off guy. Right. I worked better that way. You did. <laughs> right. And even back then, you were like flipping cars, weren't you? I was. Yeah. Yeah. So Mike has always had this, this side hustle of uh, buying and selling cars. He's always driving a pretty cool car. And even back then, I can remember telling you, you're so naturally gifted at this. You're so good at it. I bet you could make more money just doing this than you could being a software sales guy. You, you pushed me for years to I go. I did. Yeah. I did. And yeah. you're like, no, never. Never. Anyway... Along the way, you've sold successfully software for a lot of different com- several different companies, and then you you took a flyer and you went and sold ultra high end real estate mm-hmm. in Mexico, right? Correct. Okay. And my recollection is in Mexico, that's where you really learned to spot who had the money and who didn't. Yeah, dealing with ultra high net worth people um, was less intimidating than I expected it would be. Huh. Um, they're they're people. Um, honestly, they're the, the, the folks that you would think are the flashiest, ha- you know, it, basically it's like a tell of the wealthiest is not showing it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like the guy with the shorts and flip flops may have been a billionaire. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. like the guy with the, uh, you know, new Rolex and, you know, diamond chain was mm-hmm. the guy who knew money. Yeah. <laughs> and right. Money. So how would you, how could you tell? I think it just came with time. You know, almost like with any deal in sales, you kind of know when you need to walk away and who you can pay more attention to. Yeah. But you had a good run down there, didn't I you? I did, yeah. I mean, that's when that kind of real estate was really hot. Yeah, right before it blew up, right before the world. <laughs> 2000 and what? Six? Eight, nine. Eight? Yeah, that's, yeah. When, that's when the world kind so of So you decided to get out of that business? Well, I got offered a five-year contract down in Tulum, and uh, I just missed home. I was ready to get back. Okay. Yeah. We missed you, too. No, it was good. It's good to be home. I did go down there, you know. You did. Yeah. yeah. I think but you went and saw Poe. I did, but you weren't there yet. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'd, I'd come right after you. All right. Well, you learned a lot about selling big deals, complicated deals, software deals, and you learned a lot about the high net worth folks all along the way you're buying and selling cars. Finally, I think because you had such success in your side hustle, you finally said, I'm going to do this full time. Really, the quintessential moment was um, I did a trip over to Dubai in the Maldives. Whoa. Um, my wife and I was an anniversary trip, and um, it was when we were in the Maldives. I'll never forget, I was sitting in my villa, and uh, it was Easter weekend, and they knew I was on a two-week trip, and I was like, hey, just listen, I want to have a little, you know, little time, a little yeah. R&R. Yeah. Please don't bother me on this trip. 
kept getting emails, hey, I need your forecast update. What's your team going to do? <laughs> your I'm, like, I'm like, guys, I've been gone for literally two weeks. Me giving you a number right now would be like throwing a number at a dartboard. I have no idea. Yeah. And uh, I was out swimming, and I was like, hey, listen, Meg, do you care if I just kind of hang it up and <laughs> not do this anymore? Yeah. She was like, you've been miserable. Why don't you, why don't you follow your passion? And yeah. I did. I made that decision. I said, when I get back, so it was the day after my birthday. So my birthday is May 3rd, May the 4th. I call it May the 4th be with me. I, I, uh, <laughs> I put in my resignation and off to the races since then. Good. Yeah. And so what's the business called and what do you exactly do? So the business name is 5MT. And uh, a lot of people ask me, what does that mean? And um, so my wife is Megan. I'm Michael. My three boys are Miles McCoy and Miller. MT is M. Thacker. Mike Thacker, Meg Thacker, Miller Thacker, McCoy Thacker, and you know, all our names. So it's 5MT LLC. And what I do is I find, locate, um, acquire um, exotic cars um, from anything from, uh, you know, an older Porsche to a Lamborghini Aventador. I mean, it could be anything. Yeah. Just, you know. Like those old... Like cool yeah. bathtub Porsche. Yeah, this so is nine eleven three five sixes. Is it yeah. called nine eleven? No, those are the, the old ones are three five sixes. I'm not sure nine eleven. Well, wasn't there, there like, one called? No, no, nine eleven. I mean, yeah. they're they're still exotic. I mean, I just sold a. Uh, would I fit in that thing? You would. Okay. If I, you know, Let's stretched it. it. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> if we stretched it, if the um, top wasn't on. And so someone would call you and say, "Hey, Mike." I want to get this kind of Porsche or this kind of whatever or right. Bugatti or whatever, and you would figure it out with your yeah, sources. Some, sometimes people come to me to find a car. Other times I know enough about a car to know there's enough profit in there, so I'll buy it on a speculative, you know, buy. Just own, just own it. Yeah, and then I'll enjoy it for a little while. So, you know, I had a Ferrari for a little while that I had for a couple months and made some money on. Um, I, I just enjoy cars. You yeah. Know I mean? So sometimes I have to put a little money into them to make them right, but I know the profit's there um, to, to leverage the, the buy to make money. I mean, it's a risk, but um, I got burned real bad on, uh, oddly enough, Nicholas Cage's um, Ferrari 355, and uh, I lost like 20 grand. I was like, I'll never do that again. So now I do my due diligence on cars and figure you out. You just thought it had to be worth this much if he I owned mean, it. no, I, I just, it was a good buy in relative terms. If I would have kept that car, now I would have made probably forty grand because the gated three five fives are worth a fortune now, and back then they weren't. There's a lot of cars that are, have just skyrocketed in value. The old NSXs, I mean, a bunch of stuff you guys probably don't know the names of the cars, but um, just certain cars have just, you know, a thirty thousand dollar car is worth like one hundred and fifty grand now. Yeah. You know, if I would have bought it ten years ago and just held onto it. Well, I know you help. You've helped me and my family mm -hmm. for years buying and selling cars. Nothing fancy except for that one. What was oh, that? The Cleman. The Cleman you yes. got from my wife. Well, she loved yeah. that. Um, but you do that still for, for everyone? Yeah. If yeah, someone I mean, just wants help, get um, He knows a guy. He knows a guy. Yeah. I just, I tell you what, <laughs> I, 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 A, I don't like dealing with it. Yeah. Okay. I don't like dealing with the car thing. And B, I think even after paying Mike some kind of fee, I think I come out better. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've done enough negotiations and I have enough dealer talk track to know you know what, where, to where they're coming from right yeah, yeah. And, and truthfully a lot of people have that phobia of car dealers yeah you know, like just that conversation of like they're going to get you and you know add that extra warranty that you don't need kind of stuff the underflush yeah, the old underflush <laughs> well everybody everybody has that fear right, right that of course. they're going to buy a lemon they're going to buy something mm -hmm. wrong and so talk about sort of trust in your business because it's got to be like one of the most important things well absolutely um it's interesting, you know, you, you kind of build a rapport um, in that space uh, if, if, if you find someone a deal, if mm -hmm. you find someone a good car. Mm. And the one thing that I've, I've found that's been really great is I've had some resales. So, like, I sold a car to a guy in Austin, Texas. He came on hard times. I bought it back from him for less, but sold it to a guy in Greenville. Mm -hmm. So it, came, it literally sold it, shipped it back. Sold it to a guy in Greenville who originally wanted the car, and he paid me more than I originally was going to sell it for. So I got, you know, basically a, a triple flip on that. Yeah. Car. So yeah. I mean, Marty, probably not too dissimilar than like a good investment broker, where you've, I made money with Mike, and yeah. I'm going to let trust him to do the next thing next year, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, and and also relationships you build in that space. So there's there's a lot of car people, but there's not a lot of ultra high end. 
um, yeah, almost like real estate guys. Mm-hmm. You know, like Greenville, there's yeah. a handful of guys that you know, like the um, Jacob Manns and the, uh, you know, million dollar homes. So, you know, there's that show million dollar listing and there's yeah. a million dollar crisis. It's those kind of people. There's not a lot of folks like that. And, you know, I'm a little guy in Greenville and all of a sudden we got people asking me to find crazy cars that, you know, I couldn't pronounce 10 years ago. Yeah, and, the, and those guys all have 10 buddies just like them, right? And yeah. They'll tell their buddies. Well, that's that's good. So tell, let's talk about, um, let's talk about, well, first of all, how would they, how would they, if someone wants to find you to help help with a car, fancy car, regular car, whatever, how do they do that? Just five? So, so I actually have purposely have no website. Okay. I have no um, social media, which people are kind of pushing me to do. Um, right now, it's all phone calls. And oddly enough, that's how my dad's done his business and had a lot of success. It's Interesting. all word of mouth. Um, I know eventually I need to do it, but right now I'm trying to, I'm not wanting to be the biggest guy in the game right now. I'm kind of wanting to crawl before I walk. Okay. I I mean, I think what's interesting about that, and I think back to the book reframing is the, 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 the frame is that you need social media and everything else. The reframe is you probably don't want those people calling you because all of a sudden you're starting to do all this work for people who think they want a car and you go chase around and they don't have the money or they don't do it. All the donkey work. Yeah. Here's the book, by the way, Reframe Your Brain. And I don't think I mentioned that this guy, Scott Adams, made his fortune writing the Dilbert cartoon. So he, he worked in big corporate America for like 10 or 15 years and just saw all the dumb, dumb things that they did and wrote comics about it and made a bunch of money. But he's got a lot of great ideas beyond uh, comic book stuff. And uh, this book is a must. It's a must. What you say, Mike? I agree. Yeah. I like it. So here's some more reframes. <clears throat> um, here's one, Mike. You're pretty good at this. Confidence in, in social situations. Yeah. Like many people would say uh, the, the frame would be, I don't like talking to strangers or I don't know how to start a conversation. People will tell themselves that. Mm-hmm. And what would the reframe be? You can. You can. Yeah. Just or, just. Put yourself in an uncomfortable situation. Yeah. Maybe you'll find yourself more comfortable than you realize. Right. Yeah. You do it. Um, do it. Do it five times tonight. Go karaoke. Yeah. At a random place. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Like play play your saxophone on the right. street. Play your saxophone. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one thing I hear and I think is fascinating is when you're selling, right, and you put yourself out there. The one thing you do have is a knowledge of the cars. Like you've done your homework. You, like I can sense it in you that. This is something you're very passionate Absolutely. about. And so to pick up the phone and talk to somebody, no matter who they are, I kind of feel that passion. I see that. Is that kind of what you're finding? Yeah, and you can also vet if they're a player or not yeah. really quick. Um, I've had to do a lot of formal breakup letters. That, yeah. You know, you, you, you get a guy and he's like, um, you do all this due diligence, you find the car and he's ready to, you know, and then and then all of a sudden he goes ghost. And it, it's real simple. Email us in. It's, uh, hey, you know, when you're ready to talk, you know, clearly this is not of interest. Mm-hmm. Let's talk. It's amazing how quickly they oh, whoa, whoa, not so fast, not so yeah, fast. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people are pushing in that space, and I I almost feel like I add enough value that you should be happy to work yeah. with me, more so than just I'm Joe, find the car guy. Yeah. I'm, I'm finding you the best of the best. And, and, and one of the refrains, I think, and John, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, is the word no, right? Yeah. Salespeople are so scared oh, of yeah. no. Oh, yeah. When it actually is the greatest <clears throat> word because yeah. no sets boundaries. No lets you go to your next opportunity. And, and quite frankly, telling them <clears throat> maybe you don't qualify sort of changes and refrains that relationship. Yeah. Also... Um, Deals I've lost asking why, you yeah. know, going to them and having the, the formal like. So I understand we didn't go with us. Can you help me understand for future deals yeah. what made you not choose us? Yeah, I mean it's amazing the responses you'll get from that to make yourself better. There was this young man who was a good friend of my son's, and we went to the beach one time. They were, I guess, they were maybe in senior in high school, and you know he walked up to a group of like eight high school senior girls in like their chaperones. Just walked up and said, "Hey, you know, I'm Frank. You know, I'm from Greenville. Where are y'all from?" And just, you know, he started the, right. the let's call it the Thacker. You know, the conversation. <laughs> and uh, and they were just talking, talking, talking. And who knows where it went from there? But afterwards, I'm like, "Man, how did you do that? You just you don't know these people. There was like ten people there." And he's, I said, "How did you know they wanted to talk to you?" 
He said, I didn't. He said, they all want to talk to you. <laughs> well, that was his reframe. Wow. <laughs> they all yeah, want to talk to you. That. He believed it. Now, is it 100% true? Maybe not. But it's 90 something percent true. Those girls We've had enough success. Yeah, they're not it, down there at the beach for nothing. Yeah. They're not there for the fried seafood platter. <laughs> <laughs> right? I love it. Yeah, That's so, so true. It's so true. I love that. that well, story. and confidence, you know, um, I think early in my in my uh, career with you, giving the price of something that was kind of uneasy, like when we do the recordings. Yeah. But once you get to a point and you say it with confidence, it, it they hear it. They, yeah. they sense it. Yeah, you got to believe it. It's 11. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's just a number. And it, absolutely. It's just a number. 100%. Here, um, here's another one. The one we used to all hear. Well, we, uh, we can't make any money because it takes money to make money. Oh. Right? With a little head shake. Like, yeah. Can't do that, you know. <laughs> and of course, you know, you could borrow the money. You can find someone like Marty who's got money and go in with Marty. I mean, there's a million ways you can do it. Right. But people just, they just, they, they, they lose before they leave the starting line. I, I, it's interesting you say that. My, um, my father, I, I attribute this to him. Uh, it, it, all the cars I buy, I, I pay cash for. Um, and I, it, it comes from him with credit cards. He, I, I don't have any credit card debt. I really don't have any debt whatsoever. But um, you don't feel the pain of the purchase is what he always said. So hmm. like when you buy something with credit, you don't feel the pain of the purchase until after that purchase is made and you get the credit card bill and you're like, oh, crap, what did I buy? <laughs> with, with buying something when you can afford to buy it, you feel that pain immediately and you have motivation to get rid of it quicker. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. I, try to, I try to not borrow if possible. Um, it's, just, it's just worked out better that way. That's good. So That's what, good. what kind of big, I guess, if you were talking to the noobs or you know, people starting out in sales, you know, what would you say the one or two things that you've learned that if you went back to the old, you know, Michael, if I could interview myself, back, yeah, yeah, what would you what would you say? I would say be smarter when you start making money. Um, be smarter with how you invest it. Um, I think a lot of people um, early when they start making money feel they need to spend it and, and, and buy dumb things that they don't need. <laughs> um, I, if I could go back, there's a lot of. <laughs> Stuff that I bought, I probably shouldn't have bought. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, um, and and just uh, always, if you look at the best athletes, you look at the best people in anything. You know, like we're talking about this book, practice and and surround yourself with winners. Um, that is the best advice I can mm-hmm. give. Um, your your surroundings lead to your success. Um, if you if you have somebody that's going to hold you back, you need to. Trim that fat real quick. John, you remember in the book, he talks about toxic people. Yeah. What do you do with toxic people? Drop them. Yeah. Drop them. Yeah. He and it's funny. Them. We get we get so tied up in people negative. I don't have the right leads. I don't get the right deal. Yeah. You know, the market stinks. Yeah. I, I remember a guy worked for me and, and um, he would always say, well, they have no budget. No budget. <laughs> and that was like everything was no budget, no budget. And it's like, well... And why are you even in sales if, right. you know, what are you doing? Nobody here? ever has a, like a budget, you know, they don't, <laughs> no. they, they don't really just say, here's, here's my budget. They've got it. They just don't want to talk about it. No. Yeah. Um, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, what's another good one? Uh, well, you know, here's one I, I use all the time. I've got my golf clubs in the back of my car and I, I'll get to the, uh, you know, the club place and, They'll say, sir, you leave those golf clubs back there. Are you worried about them? I'm like, I'm worried if they don't get stolen. I would love for them to get stolen. I need new, I, those things aren't working right. Right. They're yeah. defective. So I want new golf clubs. And I would get them if the insurance, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm ready for, for new golf clubs. Is that clubs. why you leave your trunk open outside? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> pick me. Yeah, please pick me. Um, yeah, another one would be, uh, you know, someone, you know, p- people lost their jobs. Yeah. They're like, oh, no, what am I? And they just, you know, what am I going to do? And it wasn't fair. And what about Sarah? She was worse than I was and all that stuff. Versus like, you know what? I got a fresh start. Just, I got a zillion jobs to choose from. I can find something better, something 100%. I'll be happier with. And so it's just a... It's, it is a mindset. I mean, if you look at some of the most successful people in the world, every one of them has more failures than success that they can talk to leading up to their success. Yeah, yeah. It, it's how they 
deal with those failures um, that makes them win. I mean, gosh, I've had my fair share of you know abuse and problems in my life that have happened, but if you use it as negativity or excuses, you're not going to be successful. If you use it as motivation to get better, that's when you're going to win. Yeah. It was funny. I was listening to a podcast. I think it was Seth Godin. And he was talking about failures, and he sort of said, you can always start with this line that says, well, it might not work, but I'm going to try. Right. It may not work. Yeah. Right? Going after that deal, I'm, you know, I mean, if you worried about, is the person going to sell you a car? Or is that person going to buy the car? If you worried about everything, all that does is the future creates anxiety, mm -hmm. right? And in the book, he talks about, right, the past creates depression, right? We worry about the past. The future just creates anxiety, Peace is when we're in the now. And I think one of the things that I think helps in selling is stop worrying about the future. Stop, you know, what if I win this deal? What if I lose? Yeah. No, live in the now. Where are we right now with this deal? What things can I do to help that person? And I think that, that kind of brings it in. I don't know your thoughts, Michael. Live in the now, but believe in the future. Yeah, you know I like I mean? that. Like just, if you don't believe that you can reach and obtain that goal, you're never going to get there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. When we were uh, earlier talking, I was telling John with the Clemson people, the Dabo story. Oh, yeah. The belief. Yeah. Yeah. That he just always had that sign. And uh, I always said my three favorite mottos is Dabo Sweeney says, believe. Nick Saban says, do your job. Right. And Zig Ziglar says, always do the right thing. Hmm. And if you kind of piece those three together, gosh, it's pretty Bill, weak. Bill Garcia, aim high, do better. Yeah. Aim high, do better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, Mike, uh, I know you've got to go to another appointment. Yes. Uh, but but thanks for thanks for coming by. Absolutely. Glad, glad to be here. It's great to circle back up. Always yeah. good to see you, Mike. Yeah, it's well. good. Hey, I want to get some car tips. I was already <laughs> in the back was talking to Mike yep. about some cars. So. Now, do we have our, a parting gift for Mike? We do have a oh, parting oh, gift. Oh, hey, we, have, we, have we have Jazz at the Falls featuring... John Sterling oh, on the oh, saxophone. Oh, wow, I'm going to have to get an autograph yes. this before <laughs> we'll I leave. It. But we'll get it later. Thank absolutely. You. Thank you. Thanks for being All here. Right. We'll, be, we'll be right back. Mike, thank you very much. Absolutely. We appreciate it. You. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, good, good to see you. See you. Absolutely. Yep. Hey, thanks for listening to my music over the last couple years. We have a band now called Sweet Pea. And if you want to book the band, just call or text the number on the screen. Thanks. All right, back from the network break, Marty. <laughs> oh, man, that was great. That was fun. It's always good to talk to Mike Thacker. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, what's interesting is to kind of watch, you know, uh, Michael said he started in 98. I joined DataStream in 2000, so a couple years behind. But, but to watch that evolution and then also I, one of the things that jumped out at me was when he had that moment. He talked about being on vacation and he just, when you have that clarity, like, where's your forecast? Like, leadership, where's your forecast? Yeah, give me two weeks. I'm with my wife. Like, you don't need it. But for some reason, sales leadership, and I think one of the lessons for salespeople is you're going to get these bosses. Mm -hmm. You're going to get these people because they just think every week I'd have forecast, 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 because they all want to appear smart. When in reality, does it really matter? It's, the, it's what it was two weeks ago. Yeah. And so I love that clarity because I've I had that moment. Yeah. I had that what I call my Jerry Maguire moment, where I just got sick and tired of, you know, the same old rat race, just numbers, results. It wasn't about the people anymore. It wasn't about the customers. And yeah. um, I had that clarity. So hearing that story, I just really resonated with me. Like. You know, why can't we just be human? Yeah. Well, let's let's transition a little bit to one of the more important reframes of the book, which is goals versus yeah. the process, right? Yep. And, you know, for most of my life, I mean, it was all about the goals. Mm -hmm. You want to get into this school, you want to graduate, you want to do this, you want to do that. You know, and then once we got into business, and you were, at, were in business together for a number of years, <clears throat> it became... Yeah a goal every quarter when we had a goal to hit every quarter for 10 years mm -hmm. that's 40 super bowls you know <laughs> and it was funny before it was before you came along before we went public we had a private business for about 10 years yep. and our leader larry <clears throat> kept an immaculate updated almost daily business plan on what we were who our market was you know how we went to everything mm -hmm. and 
this this is this is kind of an exaggeration, but not really. I mean, the day we went public, that thing went out the window. It yeah. it became what number do we have to hit this yeah. month? And so the point here is that was the original framing for most people was what is your goal, and what the book talks about, and I've heard Scott talk about it before is. You know, you really don't want to have goals. You want to have a process you follow to improve on something. Like mm-hmm. like a weight goal, for example. If I wanted to lose 20 pounds, I would put it up on the wall and check it every day and take a sauna and eat less, whatever it is. I don't know how to do it, but, I mean, there's got to be some way yeah, that I would lose the weight, and then I would, it would be done, and then I'm probably just gaining it right back. Yep. But if I had a process to live and eat differently, then I think I would be just – forever healthy. Yeah. And I, and I think we really see that in sales, right? I think, you know, I I think, you know, one of the advice I would have for young salespeople and people in the business is they're going to get leaders that all they talk about is goals and numbers, goals, numbers, goals, numbers, right? And you start to believe. So the, the frame is that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. And what's, what Scott Am's taught, and he talked about this in his previous book, he said, goals are for losers, is that it is about the process. What as salespeople, it's not just the number because you can't control the outcome. You can't. What you can control is the process, the number of calls you're making, the people. As as I think Michael said, right, the key to his business, picking up the phone and talking to people. How many people, if he just sat there and stared at the phone, are going to just call them? He doesn't have social media, didn't have a website. So, so a typical salesperson, this is something that I struggled with as a salesperson way back when, was people would tell me things, but I couldn't quite understand how to do it. So the how of the process you're talking about would be something like, you know, the, the wrong way to do it is to look at your pipeline and say, I've got to close this, these mm-hmm. two deals to make my number. And that's all month long, that's all you're thinking about. The good way to do it is to say, every day, I'm going to make 10 prospecting calls and try to build my pipeline. I'm going to call the people in my pipeline and, you know, see how we're doing on the deals. I'm going to do so much training. So I'm going to get a little bit better at what I do every day, yep. et cetera, et cetera. So you have something that just makes you better and your territories managed better every day. And eventually that will lead to massive success. Yeah. I'll give you one last reframe yeah. was that it was about the number of calls. Yeah. And we started struggling with that. What we said at, at Advoco was you need to have so many meaningful conversations, mm-hmm. right? Because just having a call, oh, you, you know, my, my, yeah, yeah. but meaningful conversations changes it. And the fact that find out about his family, where do you go to school? What, you know, you don't have to just be closing a deal. And yeah. so to us, we looked at it as how many meaningful conversations can we have? And a meaningful conversation is I'm not interested. We have a maintenance system. We're not looking, but I appreciate you calling. That's mm-hmm. a meaningful conversation because mm-hmm. we got what we needed. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> the point is whatever you're working on, this book says it, and Marty and I say it too, you need to figure out a process that will move you towards that that ultimate uh, thing that you want to be and not just a goal. <clears throat> and I can, from personal experience, I can tell you I've had several moments in my life where I've worked, 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 made a goal, and then just been like deflated. Yep. And then just kind of shrugged my shoulders and just like, and then it really, and, and taking my eye off the ball, mm-hmm. you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, you know, you're not doing what you were doing before and you have to kind of ramp it back up. Whereas if you said, I'm following this process, uh, let's say an exercise process, a nutrition process, uh, an education process. It's forever, mm-hmm. right? Because you're constantly going to get better. Yep. So, um, great anyway, recommendation on the book. It's it's the recommendation on the book. Uh, but the whole talk today has been around sales talk today has been around attitude, mm-hmm. and all of these reframes will help people's have a better attitude and practice in anything practice, figuring out a way to make whatever comes up in your life, you know, a positive thing. Yep. Even if you're not right, just do it. Yep. And thank you for getting me to read the book. Yeah, man. Yeah, That's a good one. I loved it. And I've got so many uh, notes here that I'm going to follow up on and I can't wait to share more stories on it. All right. Well, thanks Marty. Thanks for coming to sales talk on the noob school. See you next time.